All right. Welcome to Miraculous Mamas. I have an amazing guest here for you guys. I have Dr. Sachs. She is a reproductive psychiatrist and she is just so knowledgeable and has so much to offer us. Um, I've read some of her articles. I watched her TED Talk. And when when I watched your TED Talk, I was like, oh my gosh, she went into anthropology. That's what I started majoring for. I love anthropology. So as soon as you drop that, I'm like, I feel like we're going to bond. Um, but she is here just to share with us, to educate us, and um, hopefully everybody will be able just to take something amazing away from this episode. Um, but so welcome, first of all. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Um, so before we dive in, it is um, Pregnancy Awareness Month, um, but also I wanted to just touch on real quick last month. Um, so April is C-section um, cesarean awareness month. So on the Patreon, it's all women from our community sharing their cesarean birth stories. If you want to see that um, or listen to that, it's something that is very important. And I'm glad that a lot of our guests that we've brought on have touched on it Um But right now it is Pregnancy Awareness Month. And so uh, we are going to give some fun pregnancy facts, a cultural one, either like a pregnancy or birth fact, and then an animal one. So for pregnancy, there is... Okay. So basically your uterus is stronger than a bodybuilder. It deserves a medal because with every contraction during labor, the force equates to 180 kilograms of pressure per square foot. And that is huge. Your uterus is a bodybuilder, could put bodybuilders to shame. I love that. Yeah, I thought that that was fun. And then the other one, I was going to do a fun cultural fact... And this one is that in Ireland, some couples save a bit of their wedding cake for an anniversary, but Irish couples traditionally hold on to theirs for another occasion, the first child's christenings. The parents serve the top tier of the cake to the guests and sprinkle a few crumbs on the child's forehead to bless it with good luck. Wow. Well, yeah, I thought that was cool. It is cool, but it sounds like a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Like, what if it takes you a while before you get from the cake stage to the baby stage? Right. That's true. Like, <laughs> oh, crap. Wait, the cake's gone. <laughs> we need crumbs. <laughs> you, you make your own crumbs. That's true. That's yeah. true. And then you found you have a cool animal fact for us. Yes. So I um, talk a little bit in my TED Talk about how vulnerable, uniquely vulnerable newborn human babies are. And this is part of the kind of natural anxiety that surges because it's stressful to take care of a creature that can't sustain itself at all. So that was where some of the anthropologic research that I read came in. And I found out that a human baby to be born as functional (laughs) and as functioning and independent as a chimpanzee baby we would have to be pregnant for 18 months. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's Which so is, that's like double. <laughs> it's it's hilarious. And so, you know, that's really often why we why we use the term the fourth trimester when we talk about mm. the first few months of a baby's life because human babies are still really growing in many ways. They're still doing what they would have needed time for to do in the womb, but for reasons and the theories are that one of the theories is that that for humans to be able to walk upright, our pelvis needs to be at a certain size that wouldn't accommodate the head of an 18-month-old baby. And, yeah. And then the other theory has to do with just how many calories a um, woman would have to eat to sustain an 18-month-old baby. You just couldn't, you just couldn't keep keep that many down. But it's oh my just, gosh. It's just so fascinating. And it kind of it, it it relates to kind of how evolution has worked. In terms mm-hmm. of what's what is required for us to take care of babies who are, in a sense, born before they're ready, and yeah. we have to step in and be ready for them, and that is that is a hu- superhuman demand. Um, yeah. In addition to the superhuman powers of the uterine muscle, the, oh my just gosh, that that twenty four seven attention. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. We're able to do it, but it's demanding. Yeah, so absolutely. That, that's why it's natural to find the process demanding because <laughs> it is. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. And that's, I feel like that's 
I always tell my clients too, in, in that first part, you know, when it is exhausting and stuff, it's like your baby's learning how to function outside of your womb and you're learning how to care for it. Like it's a yes. first time for both of you. You're both learning, you yep. know, if you kind of see it more like that, you know, um, yep. it might help some people, but, um, I mean, you're a reproductive psychiatrist, so why don't you kind of share how you got into that and what exactly you do? Yeah, sure. So reproductive psychiatry is a field that was developed to help women understand what medicines were safe to take during pregnancy and breastfeeding if they had a history of depression. And Mm -hmm. antidepressants are, are of the most commonly prescribed medications for women of reproductive age. So this was a needed field because general psychiatrists and and OBs didn't have data to reassure patients. So my field kind of stepped in and started learning, piggybacking off of a lot of the research that was done in Europe, where we we really had a lot of very reassuring data about how some medications had a relatively low risk for use during pregnancy and breastfeeding. And in comparison, some people when they were having their symptoms of depression, anxiety, those symptoms may, for some people, been of even a higher risk for the baby um, in terms of risk of preterm labor, increasing surging stress hormones, increased risk of kind of leaning on your cigarettes or alcohol to reduce your stress if you're not properly treated for your depression and anxiety. So this is a field that was designed to help people who needed to know what to do in those situations and people who sort of developed postpartum depression who maybe didn't have a history. Um, And but during that work, I was working um, in hospitals with those patients. And then I saw a separate category of people. And this was actually the largest category of people, which, which was people who were struggling and feeling like this isn't what I expected. I'm concerned. But when I went through the, the diagnostic criteria with them for postpartum depression, they were not they were not clinically symptomatic of depression and anxiety and yeah. i sort of it said to them um, somewhat similar to what we started with talking about this is a very demanding job it's designed to be that way um mm-hmm. you, you stress is a normal part of the process this this experience of feeling like you have the natural intuition that guides you at every moment feeling you know calm and serene and um and mostly blissful is is less common than than the alternative which is a variety of emotions ranging from happy to sad to anxious to scared to angry to guilty to all of it and so this i I was i found myself repeating this reassuring advice to people and they found it so reassuring and that really led to the thought okay this information needs to be out there for everyone we really need Mm -hmm. other language to explain what is discomfort in pregnancy and new motherhood that's not postpartum depression, but it's just part of the developmental transition. So yeah. that led to a couple of projects, but really it's one initiative. And um, and the first was my TED Talk, which was around this term matrescence, which sounds like yes. adolescence. Mm-hmm. And, and that's a body, mind, and hormone transition. And so it's a great analogy to help people wrap their heads around, okay, if it's not depression, what is it? Well, we know teenagers go through a demanding, awkward transition. Body, mind, and hormone. Also identity. When teenagers are feeling all over the place, we don't assume they're depressed. Sometimes right. teen- teenagers are struggling with depression as well. But adolescence is a demanding, awkward phase. And so is matrescence. So is the transition to motherhood. Some women also have depression, but just because someone is feeling out of sorts does not mean they have clinical depression. Right. And then the book, which is coming out on Tuesday, which I co-authored with a wonderful colleague, Catherine Berndorf, is a guide. It's really a guide to your matrescence. So it starts with your first trimester, the moment you find out that you're pregnant, and it ends at the first year of motherhood. And it's a guide to what to expect emotionally when you're expecting Mm -hmm. It goes through all the most common psychologically charged moments that we've seen in the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of women we've worked with to reassure them, to say, this is what we see. This is the range of normal. And it goes from everything to feeling uh, panic once you see the plus sign on the P-stick to feeling 
disappointed mm-hmm. if you find out you're having a boy when you wanted a girl to feeling yeah. super anxious, waiting for genetic testing results to uh, arguing with your partner about who to tell when maybe you want to tell your best friend, but maybe he or she wants you to wait until after the first trimester um, to dealing with the involvement of families and moving from your, your going from your parents to being your primarily families to creating your own nuclear families. How do you draw boundaries with mothers and grandmothers and mothers-in-laws to fear around labor and how labor can trigger trauma and how to articulate your needs in the hospital. And then all the stuff around the fourth trimester in the first year, we talk about attachment. What is healthy attachment? What is attachment that um, you should be sort of looking into? How does uh, breastfeeding and then starting with feeding with solids trigger your own emotions and, and can be connected to your own frustrations? Um, separation anxiety around sleeping and around weaning and around leaving the house for the first few times. Um, So many different things, preparing your older child for the arrival of a new baby. So we really go through the guide. It's, it's, it's the, the last chapter does address postpartum depression. Um, but it's just one chapter in the book and it's really a guide to everything, but, and, I hope for some people it prevents postpartum depression because we know that social isolation is a trigger for postpartum depression. And I think sometimes when people are going through a struggle, they think they're the only one. And so they don't talk about it. But Mm -hmm. we learn that sometimes putting your feelings into words and creating community can be protective for mood. Yeah. So No, absolutely. Hopefully this book will empower people, educate them, um, reassure them that they're not alone. And then also let them know that it's also okay at any time to ask your doctor for support and questions if you're not sure if you need help. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I I mean, it sounds like an amazing book because it's normalizing a lot of the feelings that women feel aren't normal. I love that you used how you said that, you know, the normal words, the quote unquote, I guess societal norm is when you have a baby, it's bliss and whatever. And you're saying those are less commonly found because, you know, women, it's a huge learning curve. Your body just went through something extremely miraculous and you're learning so many new things and that there, there isn't really tons out there right now right now there's conversations surrounding it, right? So now there are groups and there's conversations and being like, mom, mama, you're not alone, right? In this, yeah. but I think it's amazing that there is a book to kind of guide through that, you know, yeah. and help people sort through those feelings because I've gone through points in my life where I've experienced depression. I wasn't mm-hmm. clinically depressed, mm-hmm. but there's seasons of life where you may feel more depressed. There's seasons of life that may give you some anxiety, but I don't think that that defines you as a depressed person or you know, as an anxious person. I knew that what I was going through was kind of situational. Yeah. Um, but when you're when you're in that, sometimes it's hard to see that. You're like, wow, am, am I depressed? Do I like, you know, but being like, no, you're, you're normal. You're feeling this, but it's great to be around other people who are feeling the same where you, you're like, oh, wow, I'm not alone. Okay. This is, this is normal. Okay. This, this is kind of a transition into motherhood. Yeah. You know? And depression is a very kind of, there are clinical criteria, but it's also a widely used term. It's kind of right. like, trauma people might say oh i was stuck in traffic it was so traumatizing and then <laughs> someone someone else might be in a car accident and say it was traumatizing you know and so right. so we use depression and we mean different things but um sometimes depression um it, basically when we say clinical depression all we mean is you'd benefit from treatment and yeah. you know the truth is a lot of people would benefit from having time to be with a supportive therapist you don't necessarily need to be in a full blown um, severe state. In fact, I would I would prefer people come in sooner rather than that. But but the point is just that there's nothing, and this is true for people who are clinically depressed and people who are, who are in kind of the transitional adjustment range. There's nothing to be ashamed of, and you might be able to try a few things, which are generally suggested in the book, and then the feeling may lighten and loosen up on your own within a few days. Um, and that's, and, and with the, whereas with a clinical depression, you usually do need some, some tools. Um, 
from, from an expert, right? But that being said, you know, even people with clinical depression benefit from the same things. These are things like exercise, making plans with your friends, remembering to do, do the things that make you feel like you, leaving time for rest and sleep. I mean, everyone benefits from that. So yeah. it's like I think of it as kind of like a, a wide range and some people end up really benefiting by going to talk to a doctor and other people, um, I think they can follow some real, real guidelines and find that they're feeling much better on their own. Right. Yeah. And I, and, and I also love to um, know that to, just to, just to know that like the bar doesn't have to be happiness. We're not, right. we're not supposed to be happy every day. And in our culture, there's often that message, but certainly around a demanding time in life, like new motherhood, happiness every day is just not the norm. I mean, I think right. experiencing joy is sprinkled throughout, right? It's a good thing yeah, for to sure. have a baby, but this, this sort of constant state of happiness is, is really rare in life. And there's nothing, there's nothing to be suspicious about or shameful of if, if you're not experiencing that, especially around taking care of a newborn. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I loved when I was listening to your TED talk, um, about, you know, I'm going to pronounce it wrong. The matrescence, matrescence. Yeah. Matrescence. Matrescence. Yeah. Um, because that just, sometimes things feel easier when you put a name to it. Yeah. You know, and yeah. and I agree with you saying that the adolescence, you know, when you're going, when I was going through puberty, you know, I, yeah, your body's changing. It's your hormones are changing. There's so many things. The same thing happens when you become a mom and yeah. having like being like, oh, it's matrescence. It's like, this is the phase that I am going through this, you know, and that, that helps normalize it because that's mm -hmm. a normal thing. Your body goes through matrescence when you have a baby. So, you know, it's describing those things and it's like, oh, okay, this is just what my body does, you know? Yeah. And we say sometimes there's this expression, which is, it's cheesy, but I like it. If you, sometimes if you can name it, you can tame it because mm -hmm. it gives you a feeling of being in more control. Like, okay, this yeah. is, this is not this amorphous lurking, scary thing. This is other people go through this. Right. No, absolutely. And I, I think that statement is actually very powerful because I've had friends who have dealt with chronic illness. And, you know, when you're going through the process of trying to figure out what's wrong, they're like, I need to know what's wrong. Like, just I hope that these test results come back negative so that they found something to name what's happening to me, you know? Yeah. 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 It, it just gives you a feeling of being in a little bit more control. Right. No, absolutely. I want to take a second to tell you about my new favorite app that I have been using almost every single day, and I feel like a much smarter woman because of it. Um, and I understand that all of us are so busy, whether you're raising kids or balancing your career, um, but that doesn't mean that we have to stop learning and improving ourselves. And that's why I highly recommend Blinkist. Blinkist is the only app that takes the best key takeaways, the need to know information from thousands of nonfiction books, and condenses them down into just 15 minutes so you can read or listen to them. And I love that option because sometimes in the morning I like to, you know, begin my day by reading a little bit. So I might do that. Or if I'm at the gym, I like to listen to things. Um, but it's something that I've included in my morning routine. Um, just because I feel like I need to expand my mind. I love self-help books. I love, um, you know, Vito and I are learning about some parenting things right now. Uh, and the one that I just downloaded on there is uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I haven't listened to it yet, but I'm super excited. So I love that I get to include this in my routine because I, I feel like I get to improve on myself and continually work on myself. And Blinkist is such a catalyst for that by making things so easy and accessible for you to learn and grow. And they have so many parental books on there. Um, and like I said, I like the self-help ones, but tons of different things on there for you to read or listen to. And I'm super excited to give you guys this offer right now for a limited time. Blinkist has a special offer for the audience. Uh, so go to Blinkist.com slash babies to start your free seven-day trial.
That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, dot com slash babies to start your free seven-day trial. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, dot com slash babies to start your free seven-day trial today. Um, I also, I loved, so you have a bunch of different articles up on your website. And um, you were part of one with Elle magazine that talked about the rise of mom shaming resistance. Yeah. Um, and I just love that. Could you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, so I sat down with Molly who wrote that article and she's the one who had gone and spent a lot of time with these, these really interesting anti-shame groups in California that are doing all sorts of creative and quirky things. Um, but my, my take on shame is that, you know, Brene Brown talks a lot about the guilt, the difference between guilt and shame. Yeah. And guilt is thinking that you maybe did something wrong. There was an action that you did that was wrong. Right. Shame is thinking that there's something wrong with you. Right. So I think with mothers, it's like this, there's nothing worse than feeling and fearing like you're a bad mother. And I think these moments of stepping away from sort of, thinking or or being emotionally tuned into the baby and wanting to take care of yourself, it leads people to feel ashamed if they don't know that that's appropriate. You know, when Mm -hmm. when babies have, are are getting enough safe, safe caretaking, um, it's okay for you to also be thinking about something else. Or I was talking to a woman for my podcast yesterday, which I'm excited to tell you about. Yeah where she was talking about how guilty she felt about feeling bored around her two-year-old. Mm. Um, and this is actually related to an article that I was interviewed for, for the New York Times as well, because, you know, it's, it's, people don't, don't really understand that it's developmentally appropriate to feel bored around a two-year-old at times. They're cognitively not as sophisticated as an adult. <laughs> <laughs> not quite. And, and they can be adorable and funny and magical, but just not as stimulating as you would need to feel fully engaged for hours upon end. I mean, yeah. lots, lots of adults are not that stimulating to engage with for hours upon end. I mean, it's, it's hard to be stimulated right. with anything for hours upon end. And so mm-hmm. that feeling of boredom, that feeling of I'm thinking about myself and I'm being pulled away is normal, natural. Um, not a sign that you're doing anything wrong. Um, taking care of yourself, like, you know, letting the babies cry if, if there's a safe crib or playpen. Right, just and, so you can take a shower. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> or, or, or just or just for 30 seconds, go to the bathroom. You know, people, right. people feel ashamed of that. Which yeah. is like, you don't have the option to not go to the bathroom. Why? Where did you ever get the idea that this was within your control to stop taking care of yourself. You're a human. You're not a robot. Yeah. So, you know, all of these things and, um, the podcast is really wonderful because it's, it's called motherhood sessions. And I'm sitting down with women who volunteered to come into the Gimlet studios, which is the, the studio that's hosting and developing the podcast. And it's real moms sharing their stories and asking for advice about this stuff. And, and shaming guilt is one of the most common topics that come up because there's this idea, you know, I think it's this idea in your mind of like a perfect mom would be doing this and I'm falling short, but there is, there is no perfect mom We're we, we are all humans. And so that means that we arrive with flaws and it turns out that babies really only need a good enough mother. It t- turns out that mothers who strive towards perfection and put pressures on their kids to be perfect can sometimes create an environment where children get the message that it's not okay for themselves to have flaws. Yeah. Um, and that your, your baby needs you, flaws and all. It's, it's, they love you yeah. with the good and the bad. You, don't, you actually don't have to be perfect to meet their needs. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's the beauty of it, right? Your baby has no idea. 
Yeah. They they love you. They depend on you for life. And I mean, you're caring for you're caring for them. I yeah. feel like so many terms you hear these days. Um, well, first of all, I love Brene Brown. I, I her book Daring Greatly helped me a lot because she talks yeah. a lot about the guilt and the shame in there. And I just being able to identify which is which, and then being yeah. able to remove that is is very beneficial. Um, yeah. But terms like mom guilt, you hear that all the time now, right? Yep. Yep. And um, I mean, you do hear mom shaming. That's something that we really strive to stay away from. Um, I mean, I know people say that they try not to mom shame, but moms feel very protective over their kids, right? So as soon as you say something that maybe goes against what they did, if you're like, oh yeah, I chose, um, oh yeah, I didn't breastfeed because my, you know, I wanted to be able to socialize and whatever. And then that mom immediately internalizes it and is like, well, I gave up my life to breastfeed and gets offended or... um, Right. feels judge. I feel like that's a lot of what's happening. I don't think people are intentionally trying to shame each other, but right. as a mom, you get this overwhelming protective feeling f- over your child right. and you're doing the best that you can. So if somebody says something different, you're like, well, screw you. I, I did this, you know? So how do we avoid that well, let's, um, in let's our culture? Let's look at that for a second, because it's, it's like, let's like, let's say I say I'm a vegetarian. Yeah. Are, are you going to say, well, screw you. I like hamburgers. I mean, right. one thing is nothing to do with the other. And right. we, we all make different lifestyle choices and different personal choices all the time. We don't need to hear someone else's story and immediately assume that they're criticizing ours. They're, they're right. just talking about their own lives. And I think I think this just picks up on how defensive motherhood, new motherhood can make people because ultimately there, there are no right answers. Um, Mm -hmm. and there is no one right way to to help your child learn to sleep. There isn't really a white, a right way to deal with breastfeeding or bottle feeding. I mean, there are just lots of different ways. Right. And And what works for you and your family, you know? Right. Right. But I think when people are nervous, am I doing this wrong? that's when they hear someone else's story and they say, but I'm, you know, I think it's a projection Mm -hmm. around their own fear, which is the secret lurking question. Am I doing it right? And that's Mm -hmm. why they're kind of being reactive. And so I think it's really important when you hear, when you hear a new mom talking about her plan, her choices, and you're having that kind of, fluttering in your stomach or, or temperature rising in your chest, say to yourself, are they, are they saying anything to me about what I'm doing? Or are they only talking about themselves? Because if yeah. they're only talking about themselves, then I don't need to be like them. I can, I can try to trust that what I'm doing is right for me. And it doesn't, just because we're different doesn't mean that one of us is wrong. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, if you, if you feel like you want to respond, you can say, Oh, that's interesting. You found that to be helpful. I actually have had a very different experience. Mm -hmm. Just like someone might say, it's interesting that you feel healthier being a vegetarian. I actually really find that, that when I eat meat, I have much more energy and, and it just have a better sense of wellness. Um, like, it's just, it's interesting how people are different. It, it's, it's no more than yeah. that. It's just people are different. That's, that's good. No. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if we approach things with curiosity, you know, yes. and, um, being able to stay open and learn. And I loved what you said. Oh, that's interesting that that happened. My experience was different. Cause that's really what it is. It's your experience. And, and you're trying to make the best experience for you and your child as possible. I doubt you're trying to complicate your own motherhood experience, you know? Right. Um, so, I mean, but it is completely different for other people. But another area where I find a lot of judgment between moms and I've heard a lot about is milestones. When moms are bragging about the milestones of their children and it really tends to make other moms mad when they're like, oh yeah, my kid walked it. Or they're like, oh, your kid's not walking yet. Oh, mine walk, walked at nine months. And they're like, you know, they immediately take on this 
again, kind of protection and then almost guilt. And um, I've heard a lot of conversations around that as well. Like how do you think women could maybe approach that conversation differently to not, I don't know, or receive that conversation yeah. differently? Yeah. No, I, I know exactly what you're referring to. Well, number one, um, how babies function is not under the complete control of their parents. So, right. you know, the do, if your baby is born on your due date or before or after, um, if your baby is in the higher percentile for height, if your baby walks earlier or later, you know, these things are not largely not controlled by parents. So first and foremost, if your baby is hitting those milestones, um, just right on track, try to not walk around thinking, cause it's, cause you're a superior parent. It's you're, you're, you're just, you're lucky that your kid is biologically getting kind of all of those cylinders firing um, Mm -hmm. when they're expected. And, you know, the things that cause kids to have slower paces of development are generally not their parents' fault. So also Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not like necessarily that, that you've done something so extraordinary if your child is walking. I mean, your child is innately programmed to walk and, um, yeah, they'll, they'll get there sooner or later, but um, by wa- by by you walking around the house and them watching you, um, <laughs> that's that's kind of the major right. accomplishment. I mean, of course, there are other things you can do to stimulate children and and help them cruise. And reading to kids is great, but it's just don't assume that your baby's milestones are a reflection of you, whether they're happening yeah. early or whether they're happening late, and. And on the flip side, don't, don't, um, take on someone else's description of their baby's milestones as a description of them, you know, like, do you go up to people and say, Oh, where did you go to college? Oh, where'd you go to college? Oh, what was your GPA? I mean, who does that? You know? And, and the same as in, in terms of another, another person's child's milestones, like, why do we assume that, um, first of all, it's our business to know how other people are sort of developing and progressing in their own lives or that there's only one way to do it right? You know, there isn't. There are yeah. a million ways. There are a million ways to grow up and be healthy. Um, and and some of those ways um, occur and unfold for children who are happening with at a slightly slower pace. You know, some of those children were just born slightly earlier. So they're four weeks behind their peers, but you know, they'll catch up. So right. I think that they'll catch up is so important though, because it's not, it doesn't, I mean, statistics show it's not going to affect if they're walking at nine months or at 16 months, that doesn't affect like their, when they're in school, it's not like those nine month kids were smarter. Right. You know, I, mean, I think that <laughs> um, what's hard about new motherhood is like, let's take breastfeeding for an example. You know, when someone wants to breastfeed and they can't, I, they often tell me they feel like a failure, but I think that that connects to it. This is the, one of the first things they've tried to do as a parent. Yeah. And so they don't know that there are a million other opportunities to try things and have them go well. And so it's just, you have a lifetime with your child to help them develop, to celebrate their successes. This one moment is not the only moment. And you don't have to feel like the totality of if they're going to be okay in life is described by exactly how they are in their first three months of life. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I, I think just, I don't, I get, I don't know how to, I guess, say it, but just when people are talking about their child's milestones, like you said, it doesn't necessarily reflect them as a parent and it doesn't reflect you as a parent. Yeah. You know, there's not, I don't think people are really trying to compare. They're probably just excited, you know, for their child or for whatever it is. Sometimes, but sometimes they're defensive. Right. And I think that defensiveness comes from a place of insecurity. And I think when someone's being competitive with you and judgy with you, say to yourself, this person is probably feeling really insecure about something because like, where's that negativity coming from? You yeah. know, it's not coming from you, it's coming from mm-hmm. them. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, those are just like two things I guess I find. Um, the other and, thing and I that... think one other piece of advice is I think a lot of times when moms are doing it, they don't realize they're doing it and they don't realize mm-hmm. the impact. They're sort of talking out loud, talking through how they made their decisions. So they're like, okay, so I decided to do sleep training this way. Um, and it worked really well and it's the right way. And then they don't, they don't realize that the person listening is hearing them say, I'm right and you're wrong. Mm-hmm. So to say to someone who's talking just like, you know, it's not the only right way. They might be like, oh, of course. You know, they may not even realize they're saying it that way. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think another feeling that comes with that is the word I mentioned earlier, mom guilt. So that's become such a normal term um, because it's something that a lot of women deal with. You know, you had talked about learning how to be able to leave your kid, you know, for the first time or do something with yourself or um, socialize. Um I mean, the term mom guilt, do you think that that is kind of a positive thing because it's defining what women are feeling or is it just becoming like a normal way to stay in that? Well, I don't think it's a good or a bad word. I I just think it's a description that, that people are using to talk about how they feel. I mean, just like, you know, my fat pants or my bad hair day. I mean, these are all <laughs> negative terms to describe when people are feeling badly about themselves. And yeah. I, I, I like to do work to help people feel better about themselves. Um, but, but it's also okay and honest to describe when someone is feeling bad. And I think guilt, guilt is, a, is a state that we can all find ourselves in um, because it's hard to be pulled between one, one point and another. Yeah. No, absolutely. Do so you... I think, I don't, I think, I, I guess, I don't think that we should assume mom guilt is like a state of being. I don't mm. think moms need to walk around being guilty all the time because my hope is that they sort of can reframe expectations of perfection. Um, yeah. But I also think it is hard because you love your child. You see, you look down and you see their face. They're so cute. They're so helpless. All they want is you. And sometimes Mm -hmm. when you're just not so into them, you can feel guilty. And that doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong or that they're being harmed because you're thinking about something else while you're making them food. But it may just be a natural, a natural feeling to feel guilty. But just to say to yourself, guilt, guilt may just be a description of being pulled between two different places. And I am being pulled right now between my own mind and my child. And that doesn't mean there's anything wrong happening or I'm doing anything badly, but it, it's, it's just a feeling and it, and it will pass. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. Letting it be a feeling that passes is, is definitely, you know, I mean, that makes it, like you said, so it's not necessarily defining who you are. All right. So when does your, what is the name of your book? You had mentioned your book earlier, yeah. but um, yeah. what is the name of it? It's called What No One Tells You, A Guide to Your Emotions from Pregnancy to Motherhood. And you can find it everywhere starting on Tuesday, April 23rd. Um, and before then, um, on my website, alexandrasaxmd.com. And um, another thing I'm really excited to share with everyone is my podcast. And that's called Motherhood Sessions. And that's available wherever you get your podcasts. Um, on Gimlet Media, and you can find it also on my website, alexandrasaxmd.com. Thank you. And then um, if if people want to, I guess, follow your journey and everything that you're doing, I don't know if you use your Instagram as a tool at all because you put some amazing, amazing posts up there. Yeah. Um, No, please. My my Instagram community is like my home. Because it's yeah. it's a community with moms, and I am I learn so much from people every day, and um, we share these kind of emotional and quirky cartoons, and then people just kind of open up with their stories. It's similar to the podcast, but it's it's just so interactive, and and um, I I really am so um, appreciative of everyone who comes and learns so much, and I think I think it's a really supportive place for moms supporting moms and women supporting women. Um, so that's, that's at Alexander Sachs MD on Instagram and on Facebook. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for being here. You guys don't, um, 
don't hesitate to check out her Instagram. Her website has amazing articles on it. There's just tons of information on there, tons of resources. Um, And then her book coming out and her podcast, uh, The Motherhood Sessions. Um, Like she said, it's just moms coming on and getting advice and being real. And I know that that's something that our community really, really values. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sachs, for uh, coming on and just answering questions and um, and educating us on... um, I'm going to say it wrong again. Matricence? How do you say it? (laughs) Matricence. Why can't I say that word? I think it's a really hard word to remember. It's not a, it's not an intuitive word. And I think, I think, you know, educating, I'm educating people about motherhood (laughs) and, and that's, that's all we really need to call it. And, and to just know that it's a transition and it's demanding and keep taking it one day at a time. All you need to be is good enough. That's all you can be. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much for that. Um, And we will talk to you soon. Thank you so much for coming on. Great. And thanks for all the work you do on this podcast. Uh, Thank you so much. All right. I loved what Dr. Sachs had to say. Um, I feel like shame is just something that is so prevalent in our world today. And it can often be confused with guilt. And she just had so much information for us. Um, She, I mean, she's an expert at what she does at reproductive psychiatry and, um, and is very, very passionate about her work to the point that she, you know, she couldn't figure out the term to figure out what women were going through. So she went back and researched and went through tons of, um, like papers and different things. She turned to anthropology and looking culturally and worldwide to try to describe that experience that mothers were having. And I mean, that shows so much passion and dedication to helping us find a term to describe that transition of, um, in, in your womanhood of being pregnant and becoming a new mom and the changes that your body goes through. Um, it's so intense and matra sense, I think I said it right. Um, is something that describes that. And I think that that is just so cool. Um, I'm a huge fan of anthropology. Like I said, that was what I was planning on majoring in. Um, when I went to college, um, and, those courses were just so eye-opening. Um, but she really does care about her work. Her um, Instagram page is awesome. Um, she puts up a lot of vulnerable posts um, and a lot of uh, just things to help you feel like you're not alone. It's very connecting for women, very connecting for um people going through the motherhood experience right now. I know, especially as a first time mom, when everything's new, um, it, it feels sometimes like you're alone and not to discredit second time moms. That's a whole new transition for you as well. Um, bringing in another child into this world, um, and adjusting to, okay, I've been caring for one and pouring everything into this one kid. How am I going to love a second kid as much? That's the question that I've heard a lot. And we'll, we'll definitely, um, bring that up on the podcast sometime, but it's, it's so important to not feel alone in this journey. And there are there is the post, the fourth trimester is super important. If you guys haven't listened to, um, there's a past podcast about the fourth trimester that talks kind of solely about that. Um, if you haven't listened to that, definitely go back and listen to it because there's tons of really good information in there. Um, and it's something that just isn't talked about. We're told that when you're pregnant, you have three trimesters, right? Well, there's the fourth and, and that is, your baby learning how to live outside of your womb and you learning how to function with this new life outside of your womb and um, being tired and learning how to deal with the changes. And it's so important to not feel like you're alone. And I know that there are tons of really good groups that you can get involved in. I know that there's Facebook groups that are solely for postpartum. Um, I know um, don't hesitate to look in your community um, I know where I live in Chicago, there are meetups. There's, um, but sometimes it's hard to meet up uh, when you have kids, but there are places uh, and resources to um, 
be able to go or be heard or feel like you're alone even or feel like you're not alone even if you don't feel like sharing um i would definitely try to get plugged into some of those um we also have our facebook group which is miraculous mamas uh by elizabeth sandos and we keep it very very open if you ever want to come in and share how you're feeling or what you're going through i know that there's a lot of moms on there that can relate Um, so don't forget to check that out. Um, if you love this episode, share it with somebody who needs to hear it. Um, it's so important for moms to feel like they're not alone and that the moms are fighting side by side together and not against each other. I think that that is just so important. Um, and also don't forget to check out the Patreon. I know I've mentioned it a few times before, but for the month of April, it was all birth stories uh, with moms who have had cesareans. I didn't do a C-section episode in April. It kind of got away from me, Um, but I did highlight all cesarean moms on the Patreon sharing their birth stories. And um, for the month of May, going to get a bunch of um, just pregnancy stories since it's Pregnancy Awareness Month. Um, And Pregnancy Awareness Month was started by Anne Getty, um, who I would love to get on this podcast. She's a total beast. Um, and I think it was super important that, um, that there's a month surrounding that. Um, so yeah, don't forget to check out the Patreon. There is, um, it's the subscription based platform. Um, and half of the proceeds go to women in need and it's very, um, close to my heart, we were able to buy groceries for a mom who needed them, and um, I haven't picked the April one, the April fund raiser, I guess yet. But we do have a few that um, I've been talking to, and it's a couple bucks a month. Um, so, and half of that is going to support women around the world, just another way to be in community with people and show your support. And also, I just want to thank, um, I, I just want to, I'm going to try not to get emotional. Um, I just really want to thank you guys for your support with me doing this podcast and just the kindness that I've received. I know sometimes it's not always kindness, but that's not, who I do it for, that those aren't the people I do it for. I do this because I truly am passionate about it and I want to bring on educators who are going to help us learn and moms who are going to be vulnerable and share their stories and experts in different fields. And I know that not every single episode is going to resonate with everybody. And it might be something that you totally disagree with and that's okay. I want to bring all aspects... um, of everything just so that we can learn. I bet even if it's something that maybe you don't agree with, there's probably one thing in that podcast that you learned or one thing that you're like, huh, okay, maybe, maybe I don't totally disagree. Um, but I just ask that you guys just keep an open mind and continue to want to learn with me. I'm learning so much and, um, just continue to learn with me and connect, um, in our community. Oh yeah. Our, uh, miraculous mama Instagram. Um, I post on there quite a bit, but just, just continue growing together. I was, um, able to do a meetup in Toronto with some, uh, um, some people who listen. And that was so cool to be able to, um, just sit down with people who have been supporting the podcast and, and me and get to know, the women behind it. And that is just so important to me. So I just want to say thank you so much for sticking through the transition and, um, and loving me and supporting me through it. And I love you guys, uh, so much. And I will talk to you next week. is brought to you by wave podcast network check out all of our shows including the brain candy podcast i don't get it coffee convos and let's talk about it